Good morning. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to uh, give this uh, first uh, Thursday seminar. Um, as uh, Hardev mentioned, um, my training is, is primarily in plant pathology, uh, but a number of years ago, I got involved in a project uh, uh, using barn owls for rodent control. And a lot of people kind of wonder how I fell into this uh, program. And um, it was interesting because uh, after a number of years of working here at the experiment station here in Belle Glade, I was contacted by a high school science teacher. And she was looking for mentors for some of her honors students. And she gave me a call. She knew that I was a scientist. And she, would, she asked me, would you mind mentoring a student? And I said, well, I said, what's that involved? They, she, she said, well, the student's got to do a science fair project. And she said, maybe you could just tell them the, the uh, scientific method and uh, work with them on, on a project. And so I got together with this student and uh, I asked him what his interests were. And he said, oh, he, lo he loved the outdoors and he loved uh, nature. So one time I was working with uh, uh, one of my sugarcane growers and we were just talking and he was telling me about how much uh, paperwork he had on his desk. And, and he, he said, my, my, my office is literally filled with, with owl boxes. And I said, owl boxes? I said, what's that about? He said, well, he says, you know, we donated a print uh, to the Audubon Society and in return, they donated some owl boxes to us. And I said, really? I said, what's that, what's that about? He said, well, he says, they, they say the owls help to control rodents. And I said, are you gonna uh, do that? And he said, nah, he said, I don't have time for this. And I said, you know, I said, I have a student that might be interested in working on that project. Would you mind? He said, no. He said, we'll give you the boxes. He says, you can put them up on our land and uh, you're free to monitor those boxes. So we got those boxes from him. And uh, little did we know that the boxes were actually for screech owls. And screech owls are little guys. They stand about, oh, maybe eight, 10 inches tall at the most. Um, and they're more of a woodland spe species. We don't have woods here, out here in the glades. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we started putting these barn owl or these uh, boxes for screech owls out on the farm and we monitored those boxes. Not one box colonized by an owl because we don't have screech owls. But uh, he still had to go to science fair. He had to talk about his project and his hypothesis and really describe this utter failure <laughs> of uh, having the right, wrong type of box uh, uh, for, for our owls out here. But we learned from that experience and we learned from that failure. So the next year we went out and we started putting up different type of box. And we put up two different styles of boxes. And this is one of those boxes. This was a, a much larger box than those screech owl boxes. And we started putting these out here in the glades and lo and behold, those barn owls started colonizing those boxes. And this time the st student went back to science fair and he had some results to report. That year he won the state prize in the environmental category and he won third place in international science fair. And so he went from absolute failure to very good success. And I tell that story because it, it shows how we sometimes learn best from our failures. And so uh, one of his prizes was he got to go to the biosphere out in the southwest of the United States, something that I was envious of. And uh, uh, he went uh, a long ways after that. He got his uh, bachelor's degree from Brown University, his master's degree from Cornell University, and he's now a high school science teacher himself. So uh, that's how this project all got started. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about barn owls. So uh, the title of my talk is uh, Barn Owls, Farmer's Friends, Teacher's Pet. And um, this is, this is uh, where uh, I work out here in the, what we call the Everglades Agricultural Area. Doesn't look very big on this map. This is uh, Lake Okeechobee, the second largest freshwater uh, lake in the United States. Um, and uh, we're just south and southeast of that particular lake. This area here, this green section here, is 700,000 acres of primarily sugarcane, rice, sod, and vegetables. The uh, Everglades Agricultural Area is at one time a, a part of the river of grass that stretched all the way from Lake Okeechobee all the way down to Florida uh, Bay in the Gulf of Mexico down here, described by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in her, in her book, uh, River of Grass. If you look across the glades, it's a virtual plants uh, because it was 
pr primarily uh, marshland, and there's very few houses or farm buildings because it's primarily organic soils, and so very few buildings on this uh, particular land. However, it is uh, a, a haven for millions of rodents out in the glades due to our, our uh, dense biomasses. Here's a picture of uh, the glades. If you're looking across during the summertime, which is our wet season, uh, this is right before a big thunderstorm. You can see the sugar cane in the background there. Uh, th this sugar cane is literally 12 to 15 foot tall. It doesn't look very tall there, but here you see rice in the foreground. And both of these crops uh, provide a lot of habitat for, for rodents uh, in our, our uh, agricultural area. Now on sugarcane, which uh, is about 400,000 plus acres of our, our uh, Everglades agricultural area, uh, there's a lot of damage due to rodents. And those rodents will feed directly on the sugarcane itself, uh, consuming the, the sweet uh, inner portions of that cane, making the cane uh, lodge and fall over, oftentimes uh, really undermining some of the sugarcane stools and the entire plant uh, uh, chewing on the roots. And so they can cause a lot of damage uh, to sugarcane. And here you can see a tall sugarcane crop uh, in its uh, uh, grand growth period. Now, if you go back and you look at some of the literature on some studies that were uh, done on, on rodent damage in sugarcane, uh, and you extrapolate the modern day figures, it's estimated that rodents were causing about $30 million and million dollars annually just uh, in damage to sugarcane. And this is directly to the sugarcane itself. However, you have a lot of uh, losses that are direct and indirect. And um, uh, some of the indirect losses are, are to some of our equipment. Uh, rodents love to chew on hydraulic hoses and, and cables and wiring in tractors and uh, uh, refrigeration units at uh, some of our packing houses. And they can cause uh, large fires and, and damage to that equipment itself. Additionally, a lot of our growers have to do uh, uh, a lot of food safety regulations, uh, mandating uh, monitoring and control of uh, rodents. And so a lot of money is spent on rodent management. Now, if you look at some of the small mammalian pests that we have here in the Everglades agriculture area, we have primarily five different rat species uh, uh, here in the glades. We have a couple of uh, other rodents, um, mice uh, and shrews. And then we have two rabbit species, what we call the marsh rabbit or the muck rabbit, and then the eastern cottontail. Now these, you can see all the scientific names of these rodents here. And uh, one thing that I've found out is that growers uh, are not interested in scientific names. They have their own classification system. They call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, here's a good rodent. And you'll notice that it's missing a very important part of its anatomy, its head. This is a rodent that was eaten by a, uh, one of our raptors, probably an owl, probably a barn owl. And that raptor has snipped off its head, killing it. And it swallowed that head, digested it, and it just left the rest of the rodent there because it, was, it, it had a, a wealthy supply of prey at that time of year. <laughs> Here's a bad rodent. Uh, this rodent is still going through our sugar cane fields. He's bad because he's still alive. He's still doing damage. And then, there, of course, there's the ugly. Uh, well, as, as cute as this little guy is, a cotton rat, uh, the growers uh, all think that all of these uh, rodents uh, are, are still pretty ugly. So that's the last uh, of that classification. Now, in terms of former control, uh, our rodent or our, our growers uh, used, uh, relied on, on conventional <laughs> rodent control. And this is primarily uh, rodenticides. Now there's two types of rodenticides that are commonly used. The first of these are the anticoagulants, which uh, literally make the rodents bleed to death. And then we have zinc phosphide, which creates a gas internally and the, the, the uh, rodents literally blow up from the inside out. And all of these uh, rodenticides, uh, they need to be reapplied uh, throughout the year and they can also be very in inconvenient. Um, not to mention that they're costly. Uh, growers can spend a lot of money on these rodenticides. Now, one of the things uh, uh, rodenticides do is they pose hazards to, to the environment or to non-target species. And, and then, for instance, if, if a, a rodent uh, eats an anticoagulant and dies, um, and it, it is in turn eaten by a fox or a raccoon, uh, 
uh, those in turn can be uh, poisoned and die. So you, you can have effects on some of our non-target species. The other thing is that rodents frequently become bait shy. Rodents are extremely smart and they are very tough to do research on because they are so smart. But they can see that maybe one of their brethren has eaten a, a, a toxin and has uh, become sick or die and they can, they're able to put two and two together and pretty soon they're avoiding these rodenticides totally because they've learned from the others. And so you're putting these toxic uh, substances out there. What are and the not rules happening. for dropping things off for making germinations? Now, in terms of uh, natural predators, we do have a, a number okay. of natural predators certain hours? in the uh, Everglades agricultural area. And uh, these include uh, um, alligators and of course being a- Nine a to seven, gator. just in that seven days. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. You guys mute yourself, please. If, it, if everybody could uh, mute their, their mics. Okay, well, we're sorry about that. But uh, in terms of natural predators, uh, alligators, we have plenty of those in the glades here. However, they confine themselves primarily uh, to the canals. And so they don't really get into the fields to feed on any of the rodents that we have there. Bobcats, we have a healthy bobcat population. They like to feed primarily on the rabbit species uh, that we have, a little bit larger than the rodents. Um, and, uh, and then snakes, snakes are great predators. However, snakes really don't need, need to eat a lot of uh, prey. Uh, they, can, they can eat a mouse or a rat, and some of them can be sated for up to two weeks after that. So they're not destroying a lot of prey like uh, some of the raptor species that we have. We do have a very uh, healthy uh, population of, of uh, raptors in the area. Uh, during the day, we see a lot of uh, uh, hawks and eagles. Uh, but one of the things is that these are active mostly during the daytime, and our rodents are most active at nighttime. So... That's why we started concentrating on barn owls for rodent control. Uh, here you can see a picture of an adult barn owl. And before we ever started this project, we, we uh, talked to some ornithologists to make certain that, that uh, barn owls were native to Florida, that uh, we weren't gonna be were. upsetting any balances. And, uh, and so that was uh, uh, something that we were concerned about even before we started. But barn owls are native to Florida, in fact, they are the most widely distributed raptor in the world, occupying all continents except for Antarctica. Uh, however, they do uh, uh, kind of shy away from the northern snowy regions. One thing about barn owls is that they have a very keen sense of hearing. They have uh, offset ears, which give them the ability to hear um, prey from a long distance away. And uh, they, they also are equipped with uh, facial discs. And these facial discs uh, act almost like a dish antenna. Um, they also have a very good nighttime vision. Uh, they can see in almost total darkness, and, uh, but they actually hunt more by sound than they do by sight. So they actually listen more to their prey uh, and uh, uh, hone in on it by hearing rather than using their vision. Uh, their, their habits are nocturnal, which coincides with the greatest period of activity of most of our mice and rats that are feeding on our crops. So that's a very good uh, adaptation to have. They have a very sharp beak, uh, enabling them to tear pr uh, prey apart. Uh, however, a lot of times they eat that prey whole. And we've got some video at the end of the, the uh, talk, and you can actually see uh, some of our, our uh, barn owls uh, devouring their prey whole. They also have a very power, powerful talons on their long legs. And these powerful talons are how they kill their prey. When they come down and land, they can come down with the force of about an eight pound hammer. And they almost uh, always kill their prey almost immediately on contact. They also have very special uh, feathers on their wings for silent flight. And so the prey never even hears them coming. Here you can see some of those adaptations of the, the facial discs that I talked about. These facial discs act like a dish antenna, funneling uh, sound into their ears, which are right behind their eyes. And I always tell kids when I'm talking to them that barn owls are high tech before high tech was ever invented. So uh, they've uh, developed these uh, natural systems. Here you can see a barn owl coming down, ready to pounce on its prey, 
and, and disable it with those sharp talons. And when they come down, as I mentioned, it, with about the force of an eight pound hammer coming down. And here you can see a one uh, barn owl that's carrying prey back to the nest. Uh, they almost always carry it right by the neck. They take their uh, beak, snip that spinal column. I've never seen live prey go back to the nest. Yeah, no. They now we have a lot of reasons why. So we have a lot of rodents and we do have some barn owls, but why don't we have enough barn owls uh, to take care of those rodents? One of the things is that barn owls are what we call cavity nesters. They like natural cavities or even man-made cavities for nesting in. And they're attracted to holes and cavities uh, throughout the glades. But we don't have uh, any trees, so we don't have any trees with uh, natural cavities. Um, they did uh, used to they used to house in some of the old what we call pump houses and pole sheds around the glades. However, a lot of these uh, buildings are disappearing, and so they were losing a lot of their habitat uh, due to those types of structures disappearing. When we did have a new structure, a lot of these are, are not very suitable for nesting. And so we were constantly losing man-made structures for housing and nesting. And then of course you have some nesting predation and destruction. If a barn owl did form a nest on the, on the floor of a, a, a pump house or a, or a pole shed, uh, then it was subject to predation by um, maybe the uh, raccoons and foxes that we have in the area. This is one of the traditional haunts. And this is, uh, this is an old pole shed that we had um, out here in the glades. And this pole shed continuously had two nesting pairs of barn owls in it. <coughs> and uh, if you look at that pole shed, it looks like it's up on stilts and uh, uh, way above the ground. And that's because uh, uh, the, the ground below it has disappeared from subsidence. But this, uh, this structure always had two nesting pairs of barn owls in it. And I always went there to collect what we call owl pellets, which I'll talk a little bit about. And uh, this was after uh, Hurricane Wilma uh, in 2005, totally destroyed that, that old pole shed. So we, we, this was one of the structures that we've lost where barn owls used to like to nest in. So the basis of this project was to develop uh, these nesting boxes. And uh, here you can see one of our typical nesting boxes. You can see the, the muck prints that have formed at the base of that hole as those barn owls are going in and out, taking in prey to their young. Here you can see some young that are almost nearly ready to fledge from their nest. And um, uh, uh, you can see that they're actually nesting on the remains of their prey here. Here's one of the barn owls perched on top of our box. You can see it's placed right next to the fields and we put these boxes in and around our field edges. Here you can see a, a box uh, on the perimeter, perimeter of a, a rice paddy. And uh, we started out putting our boxes on 16 foot post. And then after hurricane years in 2004 and 2005, our posts started getting shorter and shorter. Now I put uh, boxes on, on 10 foot posts and I try to get them about eight feet off the ground. And the barn owls, they don't seem to matter. So uh, uh, that's been a, a blessing for us. Uh, we can buy shorter posts and still have success. Sometimes we'll place a box, if we do have an old pole or a pole shed or a, a pump house, we'll put it up in the rafters of those pole sheds. Now a little bit about barn owl biology. Uh, here's a nesting pair of barn owls. Uh, you can see the male. Uh, this is the, the male here. He's got a much lighter uh, breast, uh, not very many uh, speckles on that breast. And this is the female. She's incubating eggs uh, in this particular uh, picture. And uh, barn owls are said to uh, mate for life. Uh, however, I, I uh, had a graduate student that was working on barn owls. And we put telemetry on some of our barn owls so that we could track them. And this uh, student, he was tracking uh, this one particular male. And uh, he came to me one, one day and he said, uh, Dr. Raid, he said, uh, he says, uh, this one male, he's, he said, he's visiting two different nests. And, uh, and so uh, even, even in barn owls, there's a little bit of hanky panky that goes on occasionally. And uh, I can, I can vouch for, for this uh, male. He had to have been a very good provider because as you'll find out, barn owls need to work hard in order to provide for those nests. So here you can see uh, some of the barn owl eggs uh, that have been laid in one of our boxes. 
they actually lay their eggs on the remains of their prey. So the bottom of these boxes, uh, very soon after colonization, are lined with bones and fur of the prey that have been consumed by those barn owls. The barn owls are a little bit, uh, um, the eggs are a little bit smaller than a chicken egg. And a typical clutch in Florida is usually about four to seven eggs. And uh, uh, these eggs are laid singly at two to three day intervals. And uh, there's a reason for this. And a lot of times uh, when I'm talking to kids, I, I describe this, that the first egg that's hatched is gonna be, uh, or the first egg that's laid is gonna be the first one that hatches. That's gonna be the largest chick. And then as each of those other additional eggs are, are uh, laid and then hatched, uh, those chicks are gonna be a, progressively a little bit smaller. Now, if there's not enough food to go around to feed all of those chicks, guess who gets the short end of the stick? It's the youngest of those barn owls. And so a lot of times when I'm talking to young kids, I'll ask how many in here are the youngest of the family? And they'll, some of them will raise their hands and I'll say, aren't you glad you're not a barn owl? <laughs> so uh, that's an evolutionary adaptation to make sure that at least some of those youngsters make it from the nest. Now they usually incubate their uh, eggs for about 32 days after laying and you can see uh, three eggs that have uh, not hatched yet. And here are a couple of other chicks that have hatched. Uh, this one being the oldest, a little bit furrier. Uh, this one, a very recent hatchling. And uh, when they first hatch, they're very weak uh, with closed eyes for that first one or two weeks. And they sleep much of the day. They're being incubated underneath that, that uh, hen um, uh, barn owl. She will take care of them at this point. And the male will steadily bring prey back to her while she's incubating these eggs and taking care of these little uh, youngsters. Uh, we'll see some uh, footage of this uh, at the end of the presentation so you can see what great providers uh, barn owls are for their young. At this stage, the, the mother will tear uh, little furless pieces of meat off of those uh, barn owl chicks, feeding it to them, and uh, they gladly accept it. Now here they are at about two to three weeks old. And at this stage, uh, they're able to hold their heads up erect. Um, they oftentimes will huddle together for, for warmth. Uh, at this stage, the mom is usually maybe still in the box, but not sitting on top of them. And you can see actually three, uh, there's three barn owls in this picture. Here you can see the oldest and here's the youngest snuggled up. You can see just the beak and the eye of this youngest snuggled up with the others to keep warm. And at this stage, their appetite is increasing dramatically. And so they're no longer eating just little furless pieces of meat. They're able to eat large uh, portions of rodents and even large uh, entire rodents uh, in a stage just beyond this. And they're starting to get very active and vocal. Here you can see, see uh, uh, at about three to uh, five weeks old, now they're starting to get their adult facial feathers their feet are almost now full grown. You can start banding uh, uh, at uh, really at this stage and uh, um, they still huddle together for protection and they'll hiss like a snake, like in order to scare off intruders. Uh, they're very hungry at this stage and, uh, and at now the mother and the father are no longer in the box with the chicks. All these guys wanna do is eat. And uh, at this stage, totally capable of swallowing entire rodents. Uh, they sometimes will take a nap during the daytime, but as soon as nighttime comes, they are crying for more food and those parents will be bringing it. This stage, totally capable of swallowing entire rodents. Uh, this is a, a defense posture. This is at five to six weeks old. And you can see how they're actually holding their wing feathers out to make themselves look larger. And if you're afraid of a, a flying cotton ball, uh, you, you'd have a right to be fearful. But barn owls are very docile. It's all an act. And they'll hiss and they'll, they'll swing their, their head back and forth in a, uh, a function called toe dusting to make themselves look as big, as bad as they can. Now at this stage, they, they are eating a lot of prey. The uh, parents, if they have a, a box of uh, four to six, they may actually have to bring back 20 to 24 pieces of prey per night in order to keep these guys fed. One time I was talking to a, a group of third graders at a school and we had the entire cafeteria filled uh, with, with uh, students learning about barn owls. 
And I was trying to impress upon these students how many, bar, how many rodents these barn owls could actually destroy. And I had read in a book that a single barn owl can eliminate as many um, rodents as 10 well-trained barn cats. Now, I'm not exactly sure what constitutes uh, a well-trained barn cat, but I, I stated this statistic to these poor students. And at the end of the presentation, I asked, now, are there any questions? And this one little girl, she raised her hand and I said, yes. And she said, she says, Dr. Reid, she says, I'm really happy for what you're doing for all those barn owls. She says, but what's gonna happen to all those unemployed cats? And so I could tell immediately that she was actually listening to my presentation. And I knew immediately that she was a cat lover. And she was very concerned about all these cats that I was putting out of business. So uh, uh, this is a, a little bit older uh, at a, another stage, five to seven weeks old. Uh, you can see the, the obvious di difference, age differences. There's probably only about six to nine days difference between this oldest one. that's almost got its almost all of its adult feathers and the youngest, which still has quite a bit of down on it. So you can see these uh, uh, age differences at this stage. At this stage, voracious appetites. I mean, they are eating four to five, six rats per night. And so they may actually eat one and a half times their weight in prey per day. And again, to, to try to take this uh, uh, statistic home to, to kids, I'll, I'll ask, uh, you know, maybe somebody in the audience how much they weigh. And a common response is about, you know, 80 pounds. And I'll ask that student, can you eat 120 pounds of food in a day? And most of them agree that they can't do that. Uh, I've only got one documented case of, of a, a kid being able to do that. That was my own son as a teenager. And I know this for a fact because our, our grocery bills went out the, the, <laughs> the window. But uh, at this stage, they're very feisty and, uh, and they are very vocal even during the daytime. Here they are getting close to fledging. In fact, these, these uh, owl box or these uh, uh, barn owls have left the box. They're starting to venture out of the box at nighttime. This happened to be a box in our barn and they're starting to go up into the rafters. You can still see some of their downy feathers attached, but they're now starting to stretch their wings and uh, in terms of uh, exploring their bodies and, and maybe flight. One of the things that's really fun to watch is if you're watching one of the webcams, when they get to this stage, they're, they're testing their wings and they, they actually will start almost flapping and flopping their wings inside the box. All this downy feather just rises up from the box and it looks like a, a snowstorm right inside one of our nesting boxes. But they will actually watch their parents uh, hunt uh, during these early weeks as they get out of the boxes, uh, they'll watch them and, and learn hunting techniques from them. And then about five, uh, about 10 weeks, they fly from the nest. Now, one thing that's kind of special about barn owls is that they form barn owl pellets. And barn owl pellets are the regurgitated remains of their prey. Barn owls have a very alkaline uh, uh, digestive system. And so they don't digest all the bones. It's left in the uh, form of these pellets along with the, the fur, which isn't digested. And they spit these pellets up. These pellets actually are spit up by the barn owls. They don't, uh, they don't come out the other end. And these barn owl pellets, believe it or not, uh, can be worth some money. Uh, Carolina Biological Supply would sell a pellet like this, uh, several inches long, for about four to five dollars a piece. And uh, smaller pellets will go for less, but uh, these pellets are very valuable in schools, as I'll mention. Now, a lot of times, schools like to take these pellets and they're, they're a non-living entity. And so the pellets uh, are dissected by the students. So it's not like you, you don't even have to kill a frog. Like I, we killed a frog uh, and dissected a frog when I was in high school. Uh, now they can use these pellets, dissect those, and, and you don't have to worry about killing anything. And you can find all the bones that are in a uh, rodent body here. And uh, one of the uh, favorite bones that I like to find is a, is a pelvic bone. You can see one right here and you can see the socket in that pelvic bone. And here's a femur uh, right here, this, which is the thigh bone. And the thigh bone, that ball that forms on the femur can actually be inserted into this socket and you can actually demonstrate a working hip to these young kids. 
And I, I was talking to some kids one time describing that. And one little girl, she, she had to add that, that her grandpa had, had that same bone in his body, <laughs> that he had had an artificial hip and had that replaced. And uh, uh, so she knew all about uh, hip structure. Another favorite bone to find in the body is a skull. The skull is the most identifiable bone in the body. And by finding a skull in your body, in the, in the pellet, you can actually tell the species of prey that was within that pellet. And so um, uh, I always say that finding a, a skull in your, your uh, barn owl pellet is like finding the prize in a Cracker Jack box. Uh, so it, it's a very prized uh, uh, find in those pellets. Now kids, they love to dissect owl pellets. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, this is their initial reaction. They're, you've told them where those pellets have come from. They do not want to touch those pellets. And one of the things that I've learned in working with kids that if cute is good, gruesome is better. And the more gross you can make something sound, the more they get into it. The same little, the same little girl, uh, about five, 10 minutes after we gave her an owl pellet, she's calling me over, Dr. Raid, I need another pellet here. And so these kids, they love to dissect these owl pellets. And you can see it. This was uh, the student that I worked with in, in starting this project. Uh, Jeff Klein, his name was. Uh, he was uh, the uh, college student that I mentioned. He would come back during a uh, uh, holiday. A lot of times we'd go to a school and we would do a pellet dissection uh, lesson with the kids. He loved working with the kids. And uh, now he's, uh, as I mentioned, a high school science teacher. So it was a tremendous experience having him. Here you can see uh, some of the remains in our prey, primarily house mice and cotton rats make up a, a vast majority of the prey here in the Everglades agricultural area. And so uh, this is a great way to uh, introduce kids to statistics, to pie charts, charts, bar charts, and they make tremendous hands-on lessons. Uh, one of the things, because they're doing it, they're seeing it, they, they retain this lesson for the rest of their life. And uh, I've learned from teachers all over the country that, that this is the favorite lesson of the year. When they do the uh, barn owl pellet dissections in class, it's the one lesson that those kids will retain for the rest of their life. And so when we give pellets to schools, uh, we feel really good about being part of that uh, um, memory. Uh, but the, the uh, pellets are, uh, provide great predator prey relationships. Uh, you have the mammalian anatomy that they are, are learning about. Um, I've got some uh, pellets uh, that I oftentimes, I'll take pellets to some of my talks, especially to Audubon groups, Sierra clubs, uh, nature centers, and we'll, we'll have a, a sterilized pellet along with a bone chart. And, uh, and so we'll provide these uh, to some of the participants. And a uh, number of years ago, I was, uh, Oh, okay. Uh, a number of years ago, I was, I was at a retirement home and I, I uh, uh, told the, the uh, people that attended that uh, they could take some of these uh, pellets home to give to their grandkids or their, their own children, or they could dissect them themselves. And uh, it was right before Christmas. And I, I um, uh, was uh, trying to explain to them that, that these make tremendous stocking stuffers. And I can always imagine a kid waking up on Christmas morning to find a barn owl pellet in, inside their, their uh, uh, stocking. But pellet dissection is, is not for, just for kids. Uh, we have a, a lot of um, uh, adults that love to dissect the owl pellets. This happened to be at the Allegheny per, uh, Pilgrimage, uh, an annual event up in uh, southwestern New York State. I gave a talk up there. We took pellets and you can see we had youngsters uh, their parents and grandparents all dissecting owl pellets. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. We've got three different generations dissecting owl pellets together. You can see grandmas aren't as excited about owl pellets as moms and kids, but uh, uh, everybody enjoyed the, the experience. Another thing I try to do with the barn owl po uh, project is to get kids involved. And a lot of the teachers that I've worked with have taken barn owls and they've made an entire unit out of barn owls. And uh, students learn how to benefit, uh, how the, the benefits of wildlife to humans. And one, one school in particular, the teacher, she loved barn owls 
and all of the kids had to make a, a model or a drawing of a barn owl. And uh, you know how that uh, expression goes that, that sometimes uh, uh, people resemble their pets and pets resemble their, their uh, owners. Well, one of the things that I've, I kind of noticed was that some of these creation resemble their creators. <laughs> And uh, the kids really uh, loved making these models. It became quite competitive. And from year to year, they would try to improve on what the, the previous years had done. This teacher's entire room was just filled with barn owl models. And here you can see some of them, some of them real uh, and some of them not so uh, realistic. Uh, but this guy, I, I always uh, kind of like to refer to him as Elvis. This particular student, uh, he, he created a barn owl pellet or a puppet. And he actually did an interview with this puppet and it was almost like Walter Cronkite in, in uh, interviewing uh, uh, a statesman. And uh, he, he gave all sorts of statistics about barn owls and uh, put this together in a, in a, a nice uh, presentation. Now, the other thing that we did uh, with the barn owl project is we would have an owl prowl. And this was an all day affair and we would invite the kids out to the glade so that they could see agriculture. And uh, here you can see uh, some of the kids um, actually grinding uh, sugar cane with a, a hand cranked mill. And we'd collect the juice from this cane and we could make uh, cane syrup from that. The kids got to eat uh, raw cane by itself, taste the, the sweetness of that raw sugar product. And we got to pick corn. Do you know how many fourth and fifth graders have never actually picked an ear and shucked an ear of corn these days? I mean, it's, it's incredible, but uh, they all loved uh, getting out in those fields, uh, harvesting some of our crops that we grow in the glades and making corn silk mustaches uh, before we boiled that corn for dinner. On this day, we also had the, the exposure to some of our, our, our uh, boxes. Uh, this happened to be one of the boxes that we had in a barn at the experiment station. This was a graduate student that worked uh, with the Barn Owl Project. Here you can see some of the little chicks inside that box. And here he is showing some of these kids, uh, the young, young uh, owlets. He's he, showing them how he's banded those owlets. Here you can see some of the bands on the owlet. And you can see that all of these kids are really paying attention. And so uh, he's talking about how, how they capture their prey too. And uh, it's a tremendous experience. These uh, kids get to learn about the barn owls up close and personal. The other thing that we do is we empower the kids themselves and we have them build barn owl boxes. Here you can see some of our finished products here, uh, but the, the kids uh, actually do all the, the uh, drilling and uh, uh, screwing of these boxes, putting them together to contribute to our program. And so it's a tremendous experience for them, one where they, they feel empowered and part of the project. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, some of the little girls that you, when you first started working with them, they'd say, oh, I can't do that. And pretty soon you couldn't get that drill out of their hand. And uh, uh, they, they really take uh, to building these boxes. The other thing we like to do with this project is to show them the fruits of their labor. And uh, this was uh, going to the west side of our big barn that we had at the experiment station, a, a rarity here in South Florida. We're going out to a box We've taken that box down off the post and I'm opening it up here so that the barn, so that the kids can see the barn owl chicks living inside that box. And here's their expression. You can see how amazed they are that they can see these barn owls that they are going in and out of these boxes that they're helping to build and they're part of that project, simply owlsome. Another part of this project is owl jeopardy. And we created Owl Jeopardy. It's all about owls, not just barn owls, but questions and uh, uh, facts and figures about owls. And we play Je uh, Owl Jeopardy uh, following dinner uh, on that uh, barn owl prowl day. And we pit the, uh, the uh, kids against their parents uh, who have driven for the field trip. And it takes on the, the atmosphere of a football game. It becomes extremely competitive. These kids have learned all these facts and figures about barn owls are very well versed on owls and, uh, and they always put the parents to shame, but it really becomes competitive. And then the height of the, the evening is the flight of the barn owl. So we go out to some of our buildings here at the experiment station where we have a lot of owls that fly in and out and the kids are, are out there with their flashlights 
they're flashing those beams up in the air. It almost looks like a Hollywood premiere with those spotlights in the, across the skies. And somehow we always managed to see barn owls. This was actually taken uh, by one of our parents. Uh, and uh, you can see one of the barn owls bringing prey back into the barn uh, to feed those nestlings. And then the day ends up with a big bonfire at the end of the day. And the kids just uh, form a ring around the, the bonfire, um, uh, talk about what they've learned that day, what they've seen and eaten. And uh, then we make s'mores and it's a tremendous experience. And so, uh, you know, all in all, the nesting box uh, program has been a huge success. Um, we have some of the highest barn owl populations uh, in North America, as I mentioned. I attended a, a symposium a number of years ago, and there was a wildlife biologist from states uh, such as Kentucky and Indiana, Illinois, talking about how excited they were that, that they had actually documented 24 uh, pairs of nesting pairs of barn owls throughout their entire state. And I was sitting there thinking, and I'm thinking, I've got 36 nesting pairs of barn owls right at our experiment station. So that shows how high our barn owl populations have gotten. Uh, we've also learned that growers uh, are using a lot rod less rodenticides because of the project. Uh, more and more growers are accepting this project uh, and putting up more boxes. Um, I had one grower that uh, uh, told me that he used to grow about three to 4,000 acres of sugar cane. And he said he completely eliminated rodenticide use uh, after using barn owls. And I said, uh, Wayne, I said, uh, how, how much rodenticides did you use? And he said that he used to have to use about eight to 10 tons of rodenticides per year in order to control rodents. And he went completely rodent rodenticide less after that. Uh, so it's been a real positive uh, public relations program and uh, it's got ec excellent uh, educational attributes for reaching not only kids, but adults. So it's been a real uh, plus plus uh, fam uh, program. Uh, here you can see it's a win-win program for all involved that is unless you're a rodent. And uh, uh, this happened to be one of the uh, uh, early boxes. You can see that, that barn owl flying out of one of those boxes at, uh, at uh, night. I've, I've disturbed that box. One of the things I learned was never staying out here underneath that box because one of the things a barn owl does on takeoff is it defecates and <laughs> you don't want to be in its way. But uh, it's a positive program unless you're an unemployed cat. And so we, we don't want to put cats out of business, but somebody had to do it. <laughs> Now, these are some uh, uh, barn owl clips that, that I have from one of our webcams. And uh, one of the things that I want to really emphasize with some of these uh, 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 barn owl clips is, is the, the tenderness and the caring, how good providers of the bo both the, the, the barn owl uh, male and female are. Uh, I call this one, Honey, I'm Home. And before I start this clip, uh, I'll set the stage a little bit. You can see that this barn owl female, she's got a couple of the little chicks that she's trying to feed there. And she's entirely surrounded by a number of rats that her mate has brought back for her to feed them. And so this male is an extremely good provider. And as you can see, she's trying to feed the chicks and he comes back with yet another piece of prey. And you can see his shadow initially, he's coming into the nesting box and he's not going to go away until she acknowledges his gift. They're just like a, a typical human male. They have to be acknowledged for their contributions. <laughs> and so he literally hits her in the face with this, with this rat until she pretends to take it from him. You watch this. And she'll, she'll, she's trying to feed the, the chicks. He's hitting her in the face with that rat. She pretends to take it from him. He goes off on the hunt again and she goes back to feeding the chicks. <laughs> so, so this shows what great providers they are. Um, uh, at this stage, the, those males are, are bringing back uh, probably six to a, a dozen pieces of prey per night. Um, as those chicks get a little bit older, both the male and the female will be bringing back prey and, um, uh, and they may have to bring back up to two, two dozen pieces of prey per night. This is one of the kids that uh, the videos that the kids love the most. And I, I called this one, I can't believe I hate the whole thing. 
as I mentioned, even at a, uh, an age of, of several weeks old, these chicks are entirely capable of swallowing entire prey. And if this actual footage it took about six minutes for this little chick to devour this rodent. And this chick is a probably only three to four weeks of age. And it's got that entire rodent. That's not a mouse, that's a rat, a cotton rat. And it's gonna swallow that entire thing. And uh, if we look, were to look at the uh, time lapse here, it actually takes about six minutes for this little chick to get that, that rat all the way down its skullet. And you can see another one in the foreground here. This one has got its own piece of prey. It's gonna be tossing it around. But you can see it's gotten a little bit quieter. It says, I'm kind of full. And that tail is the last thing to go down and it goes down kind of like a piece of spaghetti. Now this is uh, what I call mouthful two. And this is where the, the chicks are just a couple of weeks older than in the previous uh, video. And this one, if you were really to watch the, the time lapse on this one, this one is pretty much live time. And uh, you can see at a, with just a little bit more age and size, they are totally capable of swallowing that entire rat. Our pre most prevalent prey, cotton rats in the glades. This particular little owlet took about 45 seconds to devour that entire prey compared to the six uh, minutes of the previous uh, little uh, smaller owl. Now this is a, a little clip that we call tumbling baby. And, and with this clip, really, I, I want you to, to notice how tender this mom is in terms of handling this little chick. And she's got, again, this, this male, incredible provider. She's gonna tear some prey apart for these little chicks. She grabs a piece of prey, but there's uh, rats scattered all over the bottom of this box. But this little chick falls out from beneath her and she's still sitting on some other eggs and he's gotten away from those, that other set of eggs. Here you can see another little chick that's hatched. And she's thinking about how do I get that little chick back next to the eggs so that I can incubate them. So here you can see she's got a very sharp beak, but she's taking that little chick very tenderly, trying to guide it over next to those other eggs so that she can sit back on top of it, keeping it warm along with those eggs. It shows the tenderness. One of the things I've had the opportunity of doing is working with some of the rehab centers. And sometimes they'll get uh, barn owls and other owls uh, brought into their rehab centers. And they have told me that they sometimes have a surrogate barn owl that will actually take care of youngsters that are totally unrelated. Uh, and they always treat them in the appropriate way. And I've got, I think one more clip And uh, this is one of the kids' favorites too. It's, I, oh, I think I'm gonna barf. And this is when they spit up a pellet. You have to kind of watch uh, closely at the end, but this is that same female. Uh, again, she's sitting on, on uh, youngsters, but now she's feeling that need to spit up a pellet. Watch how tenderly she steps so that she doesn't step on those youngsters. And here it comes. La, And if you look at the bottom of the, the nesting box, it's totally uh, uh, enveloped with, with uh, bones and fur from, that come from those pellets that they've regurgitated. So you can see how many pellets have been regurgitated and how many prey uh, there have been there. So a, a barn owl box is literally what I call a, a rodent graveyard. And um, I think that's uh, pretty much the end. Um, we'll try to see if we can uh, accommodate questions. Okay, yeah, uh, with regard to uh, somebody asked, aren't the Great Lakes uh, fresh water? 
And yes, yes, the Great Lakes are fresh water. And the only one that's entirely within the United States is Lake Michigan. So Lake Michigan is really the only great way or other lake that's larger than Lake Okeechobee as far as a freshwater lake. And so, uh, so uh, but that's a good question. And, and uh, I'm glad you asked that. Okay, our, our barn owl boxes uh, uh, typically are about uh, 36 inches uh, uh, long by one foot wide and about 16 to 18 inches uh, tall. And uh, one of the things that's kind of important about those dimensions is that it provides a very uh, um, dark corner at the end opposite that, that entrance hole. And that is always where the barn owls will, will uh, lay their eggs and those chicks will develop. And so that what I call the horizontal model like that is, is really uh, well adapted for that dark corner and it provides lots of floor space. Barn, owl, uh, barn owls, because they have so many young, they really require a lot of, a lot of room compared to other uh, owl species. Um, some of the other owl species will only have one or two young, uh, whereas barn owls uh, in our area, typically four to seven. Um, in some other areas of the world, uh, I, I've traveled over to Israel and we saw clutches over there of up to 13 uh, eggs in a, in, an entire, in a clutch. But one thing about barn owls in Florida is that they actually have two nesting seasons. They nest in the fall and they nest in the spring. And one of the things that, that really makes uh, uh, that a, a good thing for our area is that coincides with the harvest period of sugarcane. Sugarcane and barn owls are almost like made for one another. When the barn owls uh, are in most need of prey, that's when we're starting to harvest some of the barn, the uh, sugarcane fields. That opens them up to predation, and by them feeding on those rats, they're not going to be moving to to a new unharvested fields. And so, so it's a really good relationship. And so, uh, um, barn owls and and sugarcane really go together well. Do we have any other? Uh, okay. Can you have barn owl or any other uh, owls nesting in a residential area? Okay, and I'm glad you asked this question. Barn owls are agricultural owls. They love agricultural areas. They need a large area for, for hunting. Um, I do not recommend that you put them in a residential area. We have had some uh, pepper growers like down in Boynton Beach uh, that have had barn owls over the years. And as those areas have become much more residential, these barn owls get killed all the time by cars. Uh, disproportionately, barn owls get hit by cars. And oftentimes I'll see them out here in the glades. They, they will sit on the guardrails alongside the, our, our highways and, uh, and then they get hit as a car goes by at nighttime. And so it's a, it's a real unfortunate thing, but I do definitely do not recommend uh, for a residential area. Um, if you are in a residential area and you do have some trees, um, uh, screech owls are, are a, a, a common owl in, in some urban areas and even bar, barred owls. Uh, barred owls are a little bit larger than barn owls and uh, uh, they are more of a woodlands owl. Uh, so if you have a kind of a wooded, uh, maybe suburban area, uh, a barred owl or a screech owl would be much more suitable for your situation there. How tall is a barn owl? Barn owls uh, typically stand about 16 inches tall. They're considered to be uh, a mid-sized owl. Um, in our area, we have screech owls uh, outside, like over in the uh, uh, Royal Palm Beach, uh, Wellington area. Uh, those will stand usually about six to eight inches tall. Uh, we also have burrowing owls, which again, those are small owls. They live actually in burrows in the ground. Uh, and they, those are much more uh, diurnal than barn owls. And, uh, and then we do have, occasionally we have um, great horned owls. And great horned owls will stand up to two foot tall, much larger and more powerful than barn owls. And in fact, they're one of the, considered to be one of the major natural predators of barn owls. Uh, so they will sometimes uh, prey on barn owls themselves. Um, do they uh, eat other things like snakes? Occasionally they will eat a snake. Uh, we, we have found uh, an occasional snake skeleton, uh, lizard skeletons in some of our, our pellets. 
um, even frog skeletons, uh, but, but primarily 90 to 95 percent of their prey is small rodents such as mice, rats, and shrews. And so, uh, uh, but they only occasionally take snakes. Occasionally, they will also prey on birds. Uh, uh, out in our area, we have a large number of uh, red-winged blackbirds, and uh, occasionally we'll find a, a red-winged blackbird skull or a, a killdeer skull in some of our pellets. Uh, but that's about it. Most of their prey is primarily small rodents. Um, let's see. Oh, oh. Uh, you can get uh, plans uh, if, if you want to email me and then I'll, I'll send you uh, our, our uh, web page. Uh, my email address is rnraid, R-A-I-D, at ufl.edu. And uh, I'll make sure that you get our, our web page and, and plans for uh, a barn owl box. Um, they're best suited for open lands. I have uh, put up boxes in other areas of the state. And uh, uh, where we've had open agricultural land, those boxes have been successful. However, where there's a lot of trees, for instance, south of Gainesville, uh, there's an area called Citra, where there's a research uh, a center there and a research station. Uh, we put barn owl boxes up there, but there's, uh, because there's so many live oaks uh, around that area, there's a, a high population of barred owls and they, they're competitive and probably even uh, uh, preying on, on some of the barn owls. So we haven't had the success there like we have out here in the open glades. Um, let's see, uh, some, somebody mentioned about cats uh, need to be removed from the environment as a domesticated predator and confined inside households uh, since they are prolific. I'm, yeah, I'm not advocating cats. <laughs> Uh, for, for uh, rodent control, uh, but uh, that was a statistic that I had simply read, and, uh, and so, um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see, have we gotten them all? Uh, I'm glad uh, uh, we've got some uh, comments here, thank you. Uh, I'm really, I'll tell you, I love working with kids uh, with this project. Um, the kids, uh, it really is a great project for getting them not, not only involved, but educated about wildlife. And it gives us a chance to talk about agriculture too. And uh, this is something that, that uh, is, do they go after bats? Um, you know, I've never found the remains of any bats in any of our, our barn owl pellets. Um, we don't have a high, what I'd call a high bat population here in, in uh, South Florida. Uh, I do know, you know, about the bat houses up at Gainesville where they do have a lot of bats. Uh, north and central Florida uh, with uh, some of the caves and, and uh, they have a lot higher bat populations, but um, I don't think that barn owls uh, are real um, uh, active predators of bats, although they have been found in, in some other areas. I, I remembered reading about them being in some uh, pellet remains in, in other countries. And uh, has the rat and rodent populations decreased uh, uh, and uh, I can, I can tell you that, that uh, uh, some of the barn owls are, are we, we're nowhere near carrying capacity in terms of barn owls. Uh, I think uh, when you look at how many rodents uh, remains are found in these boxes, we know that they're having, uh, uh, they, that they definitely destroy a lot of rodents. Uh, however, rodents, uh, they, can, they can build populations rather quickly too. But uh, a lot of our growers uh, uh, have attested that, that uh, once they've started and put out enough barn owl boxes, uh, you know, that they've had less rodent damage on some of their cane. And so this is something that we're starting to promote uh, more, more uh, readily now uh, uh, as we've uh, come uh, to maturity with this uh, project. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, uh, with that, we'll uh, end. That was a great presentation. Let's thank Dr. Wade for this uh, great presentation. And I know there are maybe a lot more questions. We put uh, Dr. Wade's email address in the chat box. If you have any questions, please send an email to Dr. Wade directly. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.